Are you ready, Maestro? Good morning and welcome to Green Set Cities Workshop uh, uh, issue number one of the 2019-2020 season. Um, we are excited to be here at the League of Minnesota Cities with um, our colleagues and partners and uh, to kick off the season. Very excited to be talking about electric vehicles today. Uh, we have a number of people in the room and several people also on the webinar. Um, uh, a couple of things uh, for folks that don't know, we are um, talking about a couple of best practices today. Actually, there's several, and we, I'll have a sheet and I'll show you a little bit later, but the electric vehicle best practices um, from the Green Subsidies program, there are a number of them. And I'm also very excited that there are a number of cities here that participated for the last 18 months in a project called Cities Charging Ahead. It was actually in this room uh, a year and a half ago on January 3rd, 2018, where we launched that effort and asked cities if they wanted to go on this crazy little ride with us, if you will, um, to look at uh, electric vehicles and opportunities to be EV ready in their cities. And a number of cities stepped forward. Um, we, have, we hoped about six or eight would, and 28 did, so we had quite a few. And there are some cities in the room. Um, I do like to just quickly go around and say your name and your city or affiliation if you're not with the city, and then we'll kind of look at the webinar um, and see who is on the webinar. So you want to just start quickly. Yeah. Big and Schly, City of Hastings. And say if you're a city's charging ahead city. City's charging ahead city. <laughs> Judge Mark on City of Falcon Heights, we were also in CC. And you were in City's Charging Head when you were in Edina. Yes. I have pictures of you, proof, uh, in the slideshow. <laughs> I'm Cassandra. I represent the cities of West St. Paul, South St. Paul, Mendota, Haven, and Sunfish Lake. Nice. I'm Allie. I work for the city of Virgo. I'm Mary Lee. I'm a volunteer with Green Step and Sandy. And Allie was a City's Charging oh. Head city as well. In Virgo. Dave Wander, City of Faribault, and we were in CCA. Too bad. You're going to go. You're going to be Philip, you think I coordinate the Green Sub program out of the NPCA? We'll come up here and then go back there. Yeah. Rodney DeFoe, Great River Energy. Perfect. Graham Tate, City of Storm. Oh, great. Uh, Chris Acuna, Great Plains Institute. Kristen Moroz, I'm with the um, Environmental Quality mm -hmm. Board of the City. Craig Johnson, League of Minnesota Cities. Eric Johnson, Columbia High School. John Hester with the American Lung Association. Brian Ross with Great Plains Institute. And Dr. Bruce from Ramsey County. Jim Blossom, Perfect. And online, um, we have Ben Martin from the Department of Commerce, the City of Shoreview, um, Eric Hansen, Katie Bell, Scott Jensen, and then Kristen, of course, is in the room as well. So um, I don't think I said who I am. <laughs> My name is Diana McEwen, and I um, work for the Great Plains Institute, and I direct the Metro Region of CERTs, or Clean Energy Resource Teams. And in case I forget to say it at the end, hopefully I'll say it again at the end, is that currently the CERTs team statewide has an RFP out on the streets for seed grants for projects. And your local steering committee in your search region may think that electric vehicles, some kind of a installation or paired with solar or something, might be interesting and innovative enough to fund. So talk to your local search staff first, and uh, applications are due October 11th. So hopefully you can check that out. Um, so I think that I'll jump right into things, because um, we have a lot on the, on the agenda. Um, and I will have my colleague, um, Chew while he walks up here. <laughs> Brian Ross. Um, Brian has been working in the space of urban planning for many, many years and um, is really um, knowledgeable about electric vehicles and also pairing that with solar, which is um, one of the new projects and what projects he's wrapping up actually pretty soon here. And he has been the one that's really been leading from our team at Great Plains on EV ready communities and what does that look like and what are those principles. And so he's going to really kind of lay the land um, about that journey that we're talking about is becoming EV ready as a, as a, as a city or a community. So, Brian Ross. Is that the clicker there? It is. It is. And just remember to aim it toward the back of the room, not the slide. Not the slide? Yeah. Not you? Okay. <laughs> Craig. And also give it the right direction. Because I've done that All before. Of I've had it upside down and I hit the forward button and it goes backwards. It's like, why is that happening? Okay. 
So, and I had, I realized as I was sitting back there that I didn't change the title of my slide. It's not, we're not at the Minnesota Reader School <laughs> Association. And I did actually change the rest of the presentation to match this, but I forgot to change the title slide. But um, this is about, uh, I'm going to talk about um, how, what are the principles for making communities EV ready, and what are some of the tools that local governments have uh, for actually achieving that. Um, so I always start with my conclusions, so that in case I bore you to death and you stop attending, you've already, you've already gotten the things that uh, you need to know. Um, really that uh, in, in the effort to electrify transportation, and that's one of the things the Great Plains Institute is really working on, and one of the things the Green Stuff Cities is really working on, I'm trying to electrify transportation for, for, uh, for greenhouse gas reduction benefit. Um, uh, that local governments are really an essential part of that market transformation effort. That, that one of the primary vectors for kind of for change are the things that local governments can do. Uh, EV market transformation requires that public and private development accommodates EV charging infrastructure, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, local governments can and already do shape how public and private development occurs with the, at the community scale. They're in charge, local governments are, so they need to be cognizant of how the things they do can impact or not impact uh, or get in the way of sometimes these kinds of things like goals of electrification. And um, local governments can use their existing set of tools to foster the community's transition over to electric vehicles. This is, it, it's not something that requires, um, you know, new and, and, and uh, you know, scary and cutting edge uh, efforts. You just have to adapt the tools that local governments already use to your EV goals in order to help with this transition process. Whoa. Guess I hit it too hard, huh? Now we know everything that's coming. Yeah. Okay. Is that where I'm at? Well, we'll start there. Well, hopefully that's, actually, I think that wasn't quite, but no, there was some stuff before this. Boy, this is not working very well. A little higher. There you go. Reach for the sky. Yeah. Okay. Um, there. Sorry, that went a lot of slides forward. Um, one, one of the things that, that keep in mind about, about EV market transformation process is that um, in order for consumers to buy EVs, they have to have a certain level of assurance that they can charge the EVs. And there was a study done uh, back in 2017 by the National Renewable Energy Lab, uh, NREL, called the National Plug-In Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Analysis. Wait, who here is familiar with that report? <laughs> there are actually hands in the air. All right, excellent. Um, so uh, what this did is they, they, they said how much charging is needed and where that infrastructure, you know, how, of different types, given different kinds of, you know, assumptions about the electric vehicle fleet and market penetration, et cetera. Uh, and they created this model uh, to, to look at all this in a very detailed analysis. And, um, and one of the things that they discovered was that, that most charging, and this is not surprised to anybody probably, most charging of EVs will happen at homes. 80 to 85 percent of all the charging that happens is going to happen in people's homes. Because that's the easy place to do it. It's the cheapest place to do it. Why are people not going to do that? That's what they're going to do. However, the other 15 to 20 percent of charging will happen um, outside the home in, uh, and, and is absolutely necessary to the ultimate EV transformation market. If we don't have the, the opportunity to do those other, you know, 15 to 20 percent of charging uh, need, meet those needs, people will not buy EVs. And, and one example of that is the DC fast charging, the kind of, you know, um, things that happen along interstates, right, or along, along highways. People can charge at home and then they get, you know, anywhere from, depending on your vehicle, 70 to 250 miles of range. But once you get to 250 miles, you need to recharge and you want to be able to do it quickly. And that DC fast charging is needed in that place, even though DC fast charging will probably only account for a 3 or 4% of total charging needs. If the infrastructure is not there, people won't buy the vehicles. And similarly, there's other kinds of charging. What we would look at is things like daytime charging, workplace charging, destination charging, public places, that if the infrastructure is not in those places to charge, 
and people don't see it, they won't buy the vehicles. And so what NREL did was they calculated um, how much of that public infrastructure charging is needed. Uh, now, we're not talking about things charging at the home, just the things that are in parking lots, in, in commercial buildings, um, you know, in public parking areas, uh, workplaces, all those kinds of things. How much is needed in order to make uh, the, in order to, in order to support a 10% um, uh, penetration of EVs in the in the in the domestic market fleet? And what they discovered, and this is just a, a graph that says um, kind of what what some of those needs are. And one of the things that's important that I want to point out here is that uh, for um, the level two chargers, which is the kind of chargers you would see in a commercial parking lot. Um, not, not the DC fast charger, but just a level two charge. Um, for every thousand vehicles, you 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 need. Um, Where is the right place here? You you need in in the cities you need 36 chargers. Um, you only need one and a half fast chargers, but you need 36 fast uh, uh, level two chargers for every thousand vehicles, and that's actually. Um, an awful lot of chargers, and how do we actually make that happen? Because there's not necessarily a business case for people to install it like there is for a gas station, because most of the charging is going to happen at home. Unlike a gas station, in our internal combustion engines, most charging is going to happen at home, so there's a fairly limited market to, to actually do this. There's a limited opportunity to install these things and make a business case for it, so how does it happen? Um, now I'm going the wrong way. There we go. Um, you can also look at the same data for just the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. There's this tool online it's called the EV, EVI Pro Light Tool, and I know that some people in the room have used it, right? Who's used it? A couple of hands. Okay. This is actually kind of a fun tool. Um, it, it is limited to kind of metro-wide analysis, although they have other cities, you can also look at it for the Duluth metro area, the St. Cloud metro area um, in, in this tool. Public, um, and you can go and put in how many electric vehicles would you like to support in the region and put in a number up to 10% of the, of the total vehicles in the area, and it will then calculate for you how many charges you need. And it lets you play with numbers like, what if we have a lot more renters than, than we think, and people who don't have access to home charging? What if we want to assume different kinds of ranges for the vehicles? And uh, what we've found is that if you assume that everybody has access to home charging, and you only count um, for 10% market penetration, the metropolitan area needs 9,000 workplace or public chargers. So think things that are in, in parking lots, in businesses, at, um, uh, at, at, at grocery stores, those kinds of places. And you say, well, what if 25% what if, uh, of the people actually don't have access to home charging, which is a reasonable number because about 27% of households in the metro area are renters, and renters are far less likely to have access to home charging. Um, then the number of level two chargers that you need increases to 19,000. And that's just for a 10% market penetration. Um, if you go look at Minnesota's goal for electrification um, in, the, in, the, in the EV vision statement that they just came out with, the vision uh, plan that they just came out with, which is a 20% goal by 2030, you're going to need over 35,000 level two chargers deployed in the metropolitan area. Is that starting to look sound like a big number? Okay, how do you get 35,000 EV chargers in order to support this? We currently have about 500. Boy, oh, there we go. Well, yes. So one slide ago you said that for EVs to make up 10% of the market, or for every 1,000 EVs you need like 36 level two chargers. Yeah. And, and that, does that still work with the previous slide? Oh, and just are these numbers all driving? Yeah, just wondering how, like the metro area, what was the previous number, like 9,000? 9, 9,000, if, yeah, if you assume that everybody has access to home charging, then it's 9,000 charges are needed for 10% penetration. And how do we get the 36 level two? Oh, the, the 36 is how many per 1,000 per vehicles. It's a, just another way to measure it. Oh. 
Yeah. So it, it, it and, and 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 that was actually a national number rather than a metro area number, and there is some difference in the metros. Oh, okay. But um, so we wanted to give you numbers that were specific to this metro region, but it, it's going to be approximately the same metric, about 36, somewhere in that variety, and that was just that was just for cities. Because there's additional ones that would be needed out in the county and, and in townships and places like that. So, um, so anyway, where I wanted to go here with this is the Metropolitan Council actually looked at how you know how much parking area do we have in the metropolitan area, um, they, and they actually were kind of interested in doing it for other reasons than than EV chargers. But we realized that it was the same data set and was kind of useful. So it's for one of the projects that I'm working on that Diana mentioned is solar plus EV. Um, kind of application, we said, what is the total number of acres that are in parking areas um, in the metropolitan area for different kinds of land uses? Um, and if you look at kind of workplace charging, workplace and um, kind of you have like office uh, land uses and institutional land uses, um, there, there's, uh, there's about um, uh, 14,000 acres parking area associated with those land uses. If you say you're going to devote 1% of that area to um, EV chargers, to areas that will that will accommodate EV chargers, um, you're going to end up uh, with, in just those two land uses, you're going to end up with, uh, uh, and doing my math here, about 43,000 chargers. So, remember a minute slide ago, I said you needed 36,000 in order to get to 20%. If we do 1% of the parking area in these institutions, in these kinds of land uses, you're going to get to more than what we need. And then I just happened to also calculate if we made those all solar power chargers, how much uh, how much solar would we be generating? And if we did all these land uses, you'd get about 98 megawatts worth of solar out of that too. But that's that's a, a one I you don't need to go into more detail about. But you can see, so the, the opportunity to do charging is sufficient in workplaces in order to get easily get to that 36,000 that we need. So now we kind of launch into what are the principles, there we go, uh, for EV ready communities, because this gets to what cities can do in order to capture that market opportunity for installing the infrastructure we need in order to transform all through uh, electric vehicles. Um, you need five different principles that cities need to take keep in mind, one of which is um, addressing EVs um, and EV infrastructure in your policies, making sure that, that the, it, the city in its comprehensive plan and in its master plans are acknowledging that EV benefits um, uh, support, the EV benefits that the plans that support uh, the infrastructure for the electrification of transportation. So this is a goal that cities should have in their policies. You need to have development regulations that enable public and private sector EV um, in, uh, in, uh, infrastructure installment and use. And that's, this is really when we're talking about things like zoning ordinances how do you, and parking standards. How do you change those things in order to accommodate this, this build out of infrastructure? You need to have administrative processes that allow for a transparent and predictable process for people who want to put these things in. We want to put in either DC fast chargers or level two chargers. And this is kind of things like permit, the building permit and the electric permit process that cities administer. You need to have local programs that help overcome market barriers um, in the private sector in particular. There's a lot of businesses that would like to do this, but they don't understand what the ramifications are, what the systems is, what the technology is. Cities are in an opportune position to kind of make that difference, helping businesses do this in terms of both um, education and even potentially other kinds of incentive programs that they can put in place. And then finally, you need public sector investment um, in, the, in, the, in the spaces that the city itself owns in order to make sure that that infrastructure is going into place, but also that you're demonstrating the, the viability of EVs in things like your fleets, your, the, 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 the different kinds of cars you're using, um, and the different uses that those have, because we have a variety of uses, obviously, that cities have in their own fleets uh, from uh, light duty vehicles all the way up to heavy duty <coughs> that all can accommodate EV in some in some form. So those five principles are the things we look at for cities and we're actually trying to develop all the programs similar to kind of the Green Step City <coughs> program in conjunction with us that will certify people 
to be EV, Swiss cities to be EV ready. So kind of what this means, the different five, five things, comprehensive plans and other policy documents that identify the benefits of EV use and market transformation and acknowledge the role that local governments can play. It's a fairly simple thing. We have some examples of this from comprehensive plans that we've already compiled that have came out of the last round of comprehensive plans where cities have done that. Who here knows that their comprehensive plan addresses EV policy? Hey, look at that. There's hands in the air. All right. <laughs> Um, yeah, here's some of the sample goals that we have pulled out of there about just kind of saying um, a goal of, for instance, that corporate or institutional fleets have transitioned to electric power for their vehicles. Um, city fleets uh, have 100% zero emission vehicles or low carbon fuel vehicles in their fleets, uh, encouraging public and private infrastructure that accommodates and encourages use of electric and autonomous vehicles. That's one of those things that gets thrown in there sometimes. Um, and then the other the next step is the development regulation piece. And this is the zoning, zoning and, and um, parking standards. You need to have regulations that uh, address the very forms of EV charging, recognizing they're not all the same, level one, level two, level three, different kinds of use cases as well um, that you can uh, need to be cognizant of. You need to set minimum standards in your regulations for the different types of charging patterns and the different types of land uses that accommodate EV infrastructure and where people are going to want to park and charge. Um, and you need to set standards that facilitate EV market transformation or expansion um, without necessarily committing to specific kinds of technologies. And this is what we mean by this really is um, uh, think about what you can do to maximize the make ready EV uh, where you build out the infrastructure, everything except the charger itself. Because that, that's an easy thing to do, um, particularly at the time of development. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily commit you to commit the um, community to mandate in a particular kind of charger. <coughs> As an example, uh, level two chargers, uh, when they first came out, were, uh, were at um, a power rating of about 3.3 kW. Um, they have now moved up, um, and now they typically are at 6.6 .6 kW, so a faster charge. Um, but they're actually changing now, and we're seeing the movement up to about 11 and 0.5 kW and even faster charge, all those are considered level two chargers, but they're all different chargers. So it's good, you know, kind of um, it, where you can, where you have some level of confidence about your charger, go ahead and put it in, but kind of think about this. So um, some of the opportunities that you have within your development regulations to do this at the city level are things that a lot of cities are already using. You just need to think about them in the context of EVs. Green building standards. Uh, city of St. Paul has a sustainable building policy that they use um, for certain kinds of things. It's kind of an incentive program, but it actually affects a fair amount of their build, new building development um, in order to require EV infrastructure in those, in those standards. Um, optional regulatory paths such as design, design flexibility or, or planned unit developments, uh, again, a tool that cities use all the time. Those of you who aren't land use planners may not be familiar with these things, but this is the kind of thing that are in zone, routinely in zoning ordinances that can be adapted and you can put EV standards into them. Parking standards, although, are probably the strongest one where cities have complete control over their parking standards. You already, you already tell people in your parking standards, you know, how many spaces you need for different kinds of land uses. There's a table probably in every one of your, your, your zoning ordinances that has a list of land uses and it says how many parking stalls are needed per thousand square feet of land or, or uh, uh, space in the, in the building. Um, you, you, have, you tell them how you're going to landscape the parking. You tell them how many handicap spots you're going to have. You tell them all kinds of things about how that parking is done. How much harder is it to just say, and 1% of those spots have to be EV ready or a minimum number have to be EV ready. Um, it's an easy thing to do, especially at the time of construction. It's, it's so cheap when the developer is already digging up the spot, they're already laying electric lines to run the, the lights that are going to be in the parking lot. All they have to do is run the conduit to a spot where the EV chargers are going to do. Um, it's, it, it, the cost of it is incremental. Um, they can do it. And, and that way, when you actually put in the charger, pulling the cable through that conduit and putting it in the charger is a lot cheaper than digging up the concrete or boring underneath it and doing it from scratch. Um, again, we, we have developed actually a, we did a, a scan of, across the nation of EV ready or EV um, 
EB uh, ready ordinances or components of those ordinances. It, it's not a complete inventory across the nation, but we looked everywhere um, and tried to find examples. We found about 25 different cities that have actually incorporated elements of EV readiness into their ordinances in different forms. Uh, some of them took big steps, some of them took very little steps, but we have categorized it into eight different kind of best practices about where EVs can be incorporated into your development standards. Um, it's on our website. Um, I wrote a blog about it and, uh, and you can download it and it's about 28 pages uh, broken down. It gives you specific cities, specific examples, what's been done so that your city, when they say, why should we do this and be the first one, you can say, ah, you're not the first one. This is being done across the nation. Um, and and the, I, will, I will tell you quickly, um, one of the things in terms of the kind of minimum standard for EV readiness in parking lots, uh, we kind of required EV parking capacity and minimum parking requirements. Um, we typically see cities at this point in time requiring 1% of parking, um, uh, 1% of parking spaces or some minimum number, you know, like two, two or 1%, whichever is larger, um, be required in new parking lots. Um, we also see cities that are, that are going for the kind of make ready the development process up to 5%, where they say 1% has to be required, 5% you have to have make ready. So if you have, a, a, um, if you have 100 spaces in your parking lot, that means you have to have make ready for five spots um, when you build the lot. Um, those are the kind of standards we're looking at now. We have some communities, not here in the Minnesota, but in el elsewhere where the, where the um, uh, market is more robust, um, are actually looking at bigger numbers now, over 5%. But you know, kind of, th those are kind of the standards that we typically have been seeing. Okay, these are just kind of some of the other administrative or uh, other principles, the kind of administrative and permitting, kind of the goals of why you want to do this. Um, including you want to be able to develop um, and think about how to develop opportunities to permit, permit EV infrastructure in public right-of-ways. This is not something that the people in Minnesota have done yet, but the city of Minneapolis and St. Paul are currently looking at this with their, um, their uh, mobility hubs that they're going to be developing across the, the, the cities. Um, they're going to be, include EV charging in them, and a lot of them are going to go into the public right of way Uh, local programs, here are some of the examples of local programs that you can do um, in order to uh, accommodate and, uh, businesses as well as public um, uh, um, opportunities to do charging, making sure that your, where the public parks at your facilities have EV chargers there, um, providing financing or other kinds of financial assistance to private businesses in order to make sure they get installed. Um, there's things that cost the city money, so there's things that don't cost the city money. Um, just promotion of these things and helping businesses understand what, what, uh, what, what the benefits are um, and encouraging the development of fast charging or level three charging where that makes sense on your corridors. And then the leadership, uh, which we're going to hear some examples of uh, today, uh, things like how do you purchase EVs for your fleet, um, how do you install an EV infrastructure at your fleet uh, facilities, um, how do you participate in renewable energy programs for EV fleet charging? I haven't, as Diana knows, my real, my real love, love is to talk about the solar plus EV application and all the great benefits of that, which I do a whole other presentation on, but I won't. Okay. Um, but it, one, one of the things that the state has determined is that in order to meet our greenhouse gas reduction goals at the state, we have to do electrification of transportation. Well, we can't just do electrification of transportation because even if we say, well, the utilities are all getting better about um, in renewable energy, we're not, the, the pace at which they're going is insufficient to drive the greenhouse gas transportation emissions down fast enough in order to meet our goals. We have to do, make sure that we're not only transforming our, uh, our, our vehicles to EVs, we need to make sure that we're charging them with renewable energy. And that's kind of one of those things that is really important to do um, uh, when you're thinking about, in particular, at public sites, how you can incorporate, for instance, solar arrays with your EV charging because you can do so at on a life cycle cost basis. Okay. Um, so I have 
There's another slide here that I'm not going to go in because I know I'm out of time. But these are the kind of four categories of action that cities can take. Encouragement, regulation, incentives, and then public demonstration or leadership. And we have examples of all four of these kinds of things. Um, different cities will have different levels of comfort about what they can do. Some will only want to do things like encouragement. Other ones will want, are going to be ready to do things like regulation. City of St. Louis Park is the, is the city in, in Minnesota that has been most aggressive using the uh, regulatory tool for um, EV readiness. <laughs> so now we'll do some questions uh, for Brian. Now we'll do some questions and answers. I, I'll, I'll start first. Did you say there are 500 level two chargers in the Twin Cities in Minnesota? Anyway, there are 500 public. Public. Level two chargers is what the what the data say. All the modifiers. Yeah. In, in the <laughs> is is the data reported from the alternative fuels uh, data center that the, the D, that uh, DOE runs. 500 publicly available. Right, and that's that, and, and that's a changing number very rapidly yeah. right now. So it may, it may actually be more than that now. Perfect. That's the data. That Thank you. Others questions. That was a lot of stuff. What sort of assumptions as to price of charging when the assumptions about, you know, one percent of spaces for a charger, we're assuming it's all a, you know, pay via credit card account? Or well, uh, no, we're not assuming that. One of the things that we've discovered in terms of, especially on, well, for both workplace charging and public charging, right now, the business case for revenue you get from charging for, from requiring people to pay for charging yeah. is actually less than the fee that you pay to have the capacity to charge the money. Um, so you, so um, we actually, you're, you're right now, and this is this will change as 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 the market changes. But right now, you're actually better off giving away the electricity than you are charging for it um, because financially, financial, financially better off. Yeah. Now there's there's an ideological thing that some cities in particular have with, why should we be giving people free fuel? Well, if you're going to put a charger there, you're giving them free fuel because if you pay for it, if you make them pay for it, you're going to lose more money. The taxpayers are going to be worse off by charging for the, for the power than not. So that's one of those kind of strange dynamics. And I, I will say that that's evolving. Um, uh, as, as utilization of the chargers goes up, you'll probably get, at some point get to a business case for it. But right now you're not, which is, there's no real business case. Um, and people like ChargePoint make their money out of convincing, for instance, destination businesses like coffee shops or grocery stores that by having EV chargers, they're going to drive more business there. They're not convincing them at the profit center. Yeah, so that that's why people do that. And I actually know of a, a couple of entities, public entities, that have, after using a vendor to to, to charge for, are now saying, no, we're not doing that. And we're take, take them out. It, it's just not, we're not worth that. In the back. I'm really curious about that because the charging stations that we operate at Ramsey County, they definitely don't make us money. <laughs> but the revenue that we get from charge point um, is after contracting um, the that charge point charge us mm -hmm. to attend the program. So we are seeing some revenue. So I'm kind of curious what the assumption that you're seeing in other cases. Well, well and I, I can, I can, we can dive into kind of, and and, and it, depending on which vendor you're using, there's and, and and what kind of contract they're offering, it's gonna there's gonna be a, a variety of different um, financial cases. But what we have, to, and what I was focused on pretty exclusively was the revenue from the charging and the, the networking fee that, and, and licensing fee you typically get from the vendor. And if you if just looking at those two things, typically what you see, um, until you get a utilization rate that gets to a certain point, um, that you, you don't make money. And that's on a level two charger. On the DC fast charger, that's true five times over. Because the, 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 the cost of the DC fast charger is about fifty thousand dollars or more. So the, the, the installation cost. The cost of the purchase of the installation of the station is that calculation or just the service. Well, just even just the, the, the just the service fee from from the typical contracts we see. And and I can't speak to every single contract, so I don't know, for instance, what Ramsey County has. I do know there's a, and I, I won't name names, but I know there's one other major entity, a governmental entity here, who has. Um, uh, is using a, one of the vendors and has 
finally had it and said, we're not doing it anymore because I lose $100 per charger every every year. So. All right. Um, we'll have time at the very end for questions for everyone. Um, so thanks, Brian. And Brian shared a lot of resources, and that's a good reminder that we will follow up with all the attendees with the PowerPoint, the, the recording, and then um, a whole pile of resources and links in that. Including the very exciting links that I will talk about at the very end where you'll find many, many awesome resources. Um, so I'm happy to introduce Mejabeen Rahman. She um, is working with the Pollution Control Agency now, helping you all um, with your seats. And um, uh, she was part of City's Charging Head. She was working with the City of Edina. Um, and so she has some familiarity with um, the program and the cities and what we've been doing. And we're really excited to have you in a new role helping cities now um, with their um, energy or uh, electric vehicle uh, journey. So Mejabeen. Thank you for having me. So, as Diana mentioned, I am currently with the MPCA, and um, my role is as a mobile source specialist, which means that I deal with helping reduce pollution from all mobile sources. And um, as part of my job, I am looking at helping not just cities, but counties and other governmental entities, and actually anyone who needs the help, um, to have a more sustainable fleet. And so, the first one is the why do we even want to go into more sustainable fleets? And of course, we need it for better health, um, better public health, and to reduce pollutants. But what, the way that it would benefit um, the entities who decide to do this is that vehicles present such a long term investment. Normally, they're at least on 10 year cycles, um, except for police vehicles, which are on shorter uh, replacement cycles. So, any investment made today, really, the dividends pay off over those however many years the vehicles are being used, it's a very visible aspect of local government. So having sustainable vehicles, having alternate fuel vehicles out in um, the public, it really shows that the city is working towards its environmental goals and really um, cognizant of um, the health impacts that pollutants bring. Um, and then it does, you know, having vehicles that are more efficient does save money in the long run. And um, so there's going to be a lot of talk today about electric vehicles, and I just want to take a step back and um, talk more about getting the fleet prepared to even bring in those electric vehicles. Um, this picture was taken at the state fair, and it's a Tesla Model 3. This vehicle got a lot of traffic because it's exciting, it's new, and um, some people were just, they wanted to see what it was like. But when we asked them, like, you know, are you ready to go out and buy the electric vehicle? They're not quite ready yet. Um, they're still looking and just um, learning. And I think that's very reflective of city police in general. They're not ready to make that jump just yet. There's some that have adopted um, smaller vehicles already, which is great. But because of the lack of options in bigger vehicles, um, it really, you know, it's, it's going to be there, and we want to make sure that the police are ready to purchase those electric vehicles when we have the heavy duty vehicles available. And as part of my job, I am the advisor for Efficient City Police. And um, so this states that the cities will implement the city's investment, operations, and maintenance plan. And I apologize in advance for the next couple of slides. They're very text heavy, but I will not be going into all of that text. Um, and the other thing about all of these different best practice actions were they were formulated about 10 ish years ago. So they don't necessarily reflect the current situation and the current availability. And um, I'll talk a little bit about that as well. But we are working on helping update those, and hopefully, those updates will um, be more um, relevant today. So um, again, as I mentioned, I'm just going to talk about those initial steps that a city can take to help make their fleet more sustainable. And um, I'll leave all the electric vehicle stuff to people who are presenting after me. Um, so best practice action 13.1 states that you should efficiently use your existing fleet of city vehicles by encouraging trip bundling, video conferencing, carpooling, vehicle sharing, and incentives and technology. And I think the most important things to start off with are the trip bundling, carpooling, vehicle sharing. 
And then automatic vehicle locator technology, I think we're more familiar with that now as telematics. And I'll talk a little bit more about why I think that's important, but not the most important thing to consider. Okay. Then best practice action 13.2 is right size, downsize the city fleet with the most fuel efficient vehicles that are of an optimal size and capacity for their intended function. And under this um, best practice action, you have survey each fleet vehicle by type, MPG in use, and then adopt a vehicle purchasing policy and practice, which um, Ryan talked about a little bit as well. Best practice action 13.2, again, sorry about all of that text, but I just wanted to have them there because these are the actions that we are hoping to drive towards. And yes, your fleet might not be ready for that right now, but hopefully in the next couple of years, you will be able to gear up to that. So 13.3 states that it will phase in alignment practices, operational and fuel changes, and equipment changes, including electric vehicles, for city of local transit fleet. And I think the best thing to take away from this action is monitor fuel use and costs on a regular basis, report data to fleet managers and users, implement maintenance schedules, and optimize vehicle life and fuel efficiency, and then adopt a noise policy practice or conduct training for more efficient driving. And I think this is actually the most difficult thing to do. Um, and, I'll, and I'll talk about that. So best practice action 13.3 states um, that you will phase in bike, e-bike, foot or horseback modes for police, inspectors, and other city staff. I personally think this is very difficult to do. People are very attached to their vehicles, telling them that you will no longer be able to use that vehicle, but instead you have to do your work using an e-bike. It's, it's, there's a lot of hurdles to cross over there, but it would be great if your city's very able to. And 13.5 is more um, involved with local school bus fleets. And there's already a lot of work going on in there, um, especially with the Volkswagen grant, where um, cities can, or school districts and contractors are applying to have a lot um, of buses that are much more cleaner than what we currently have operating. And then 13.6 is the retrofit of city diesel engines or auxiliary powers and then electrified parking spaces. And this is one of those that are a little bit dated because when these came out, a lot of um, the diesel vehicles that were being used were pre-2007, and they didn't have all of the um, um, CPF and everything to remove the set and the knock, which now, because of the way that city police transitioned, a lot, we have a lot more newer vehicles that are post-2007 and won't be having the same negative impact. But um, auxiliary power units is one that is um, something that we can still implement in city fleet, especially for vehicles that are um, idling a lot. And so it does help you know, decrease pollutants and improve um, fuel efficiency. Okay, so going to the steps that you can take. And so the first one is to start the conversation because you have a lot of fleet users, especially in the bigger cities, who, again, are very attached to their vehicles, very attached to the way that things have been going on for a while, and just coming in directly and being like, we'll be getting electric vehicles, that doesn't go over very well. So start the conversation early, talk to them about why this is happening, and ask for feedback because these are the users of the vehicle. They know their job the best. So how they think they can improve their fuel efficiency, how they think that electric vehicles or other alternate fuel, fuel vehicles might fit into the, the work that they're doing. Number two is create a system to record and track gas use and MPG. And almost all fleet managers have some way of tracking this. But it's not going to be in um, the format that you would need to track efficiency year after year. And so you know, just starting to do that, starting to collect that information. Um, when I was at the city of Edina, they were using this system that's been in place since I think like 2004-ish. And it's just, it's very cumbersome and I had to create that system to be able to pull that data, put it into a spreadsheet that could be easily analyzed. Number three, adopt the vehicle purchasing policy practice. And this is important because as I mentioned in the beginning, these vehicles are going to be used for a minimum of 10 years. And so being able to, if you have that policy in place, making sure that every vehicle that's being purchased is the right size 
and the muscular vision it can be is very important. Number four, the behavior change campaign. I was talking a little bit earlier about how this is the most difficult thing to do, but it also has the most benefits because things have changed over the years. It, it used to be previously that they would recommend idling your vehicle and not turning it off and restarting, but now that's changed, but the practice really hasn't changed in um, city fleets. So just bringing that information and also not attacking people for doing what they're already doing. Because again, this is a very sensitive topic. I never realized how sensitive it is until I actually started working with fleets. Um, people really are attached to their vehicles and it's great because they take great care of their vehicles, but on the other hand, when you're trying to make changes, it can get kind of um, difficult. Um, so there's, in, under behavior change, there's no idling, and then training for efficient vehicle operation. And this can be part of, you know, the annual safety training that employees have to do, or part of orientation. And um, it can be something as simple as talking about how you, you don't need to brake as often and just not accelerate as hard. And a lot of times, you know, it's just small things that you can do to help improve the fuel efficiency of all the vehicles in the fleet. And then trip bundling, carpooling, and vehicle sharing. I know working in the PCA, that's something that's very encouraged. But just spreading that information and having managers encourage it too for people who are going to meetings to be able to um, you know, share a vehicle. And um, that just cuts down on trips and cuts down on the wear and tear on vehicles. And then the last one I'm talking about is examine opportunities for telematics. And I used to think that telematics would be the best thing to do for a fleet because you have that hard data. You know, when you have that information, you can really convince people. But again, that's not really the case. Yes, it provides a lot of good information. It provides you with details on how the vehicles are being operated right now. But it doesn't really, um, you have to make that connection between what the data from the telematics is and what the actual use of the vehicle is and how those two coordinate together to be able to come up with the right fit for um, an alternative fuel vehicle. And I think what makes a lot of this difficult right now is because there is not that many heavy duty vehicles that can be um, adopted by city fleets, and that's where most of their fuel use is going to, the snowplow trucks and the utility trucks. And so being able to start that conversation with the snowplow operators, with the utility truck operators, because in the next couple of years, there's definitely going to be a lot of development in that, and you want to have that data ready. So when that truck comes up for replacement, you can you know, convince city council to be spending that extra money, because we all know that you know, we want to be fiscally responsible and not waste taxpayer money. So just having that data available readily so that you can make those quick decisions when things do need to be replaced and there are alternatives um, available on the market. And so how can I help? Um, I can provide advice on engaging with stakeholders and what language to use. I can help in developing the behavior change campaign. I helped with that at the City of Edina and I'm happy to um, sort of walk you through the process, how to create incentive for people to actually make that change. Um, help navigate resources. Uh, the Green Step City's website is amazing. There's just a ton of resources on there, but it's kind of difficult to, you know, go through. And especially, this is not, this is my job is to be a mobile welfare specialist. Most people working at cities have a hundred other things they need to do. So I can help you with the uh, resources that are already on the Green Step City's website, and also direct you towards new resources that um, may have become available. And then I can assist in creating a fuel use and input MPG reporting plan and structure. Um, I'm, I think if you survey like five different cities, they're probably using five different systems of doing this. And so it, you know, I can help you sort of figure out how, how to get that information off the system and how to get it into uh, like even an Excel spreadsheet um, to help make decisions going forward. And then um, as part of my job at the NPCA, I also do research on what new alternatives are coming up. I work very closely with people who are involved in um, like the VW settlements, so they also are aware of a lot of the alternatives. And so I can help with suggestions on what might be a good fit for your fleet. And that is what I had for you. Um, are there any questions? I know I flew through that, but I think we were getting a little bit behind on time. Oh, okay. Does anybody anybody think that they could use some some help and support from Benjamin? 
Maybe some people on the webinar, yeah, from hands raised. So please contact me. I am happy to just start off with a conversation on the phone and then um, work more closely to get you what um, resources you would need. Thank you. Um, we're um, really happy to have um, a couple of representatives from the city's charging ahead effort talk about their experience and some of the pieces um, that they um, worked on during the effort. And we'll start with Dave Wanberg from the city of Faribault, who is like superstar presenter because I think I ask him for every single workshop or anything that I have. Um, he has a great presentation about suites and the first study that they did in Faribault. And, um, and you know, I didn't know until the Green Set Cities. Um, Trivia of the summer that Faribault is where the tilt of the world was um, uh, made, um, uh, invented, and actually I saw a sign at the state fair and I took a picture and I'm going to send it to you, Kristen. But yeah, the city of Faribault, if you didn't know, that's where the tilt of the world was, um, was invented. So Dave Wanberg, come and tell us about, please. You know, don't say you didn't learn anything from me today. You know, and I, I think the uh, water slide was invented by that same person oh. over the water park. I can find that now. Yeah. Or, or, uh, Gellner, yeah. So he, he invented a number of different kinds of things there. So, Well, thank you. It's great to be here. Again, I'm Dave Wanberg with the city of Faribault. Um, in the next 10 minutes or so, we'll just be talking about the sleep study that we did, um, why we did it, how we did it, how we're going to use that information, and then how you might be able to do a fleet study yourself if you haven't, or how you might be able to use some of the data of some of the communities like Faribault that have done a fleet study, instead of actually funding the, the fleet study, you might be able to glean some information from some of the things that we've done. So now I am pushing this the wrong direction, I think. There we go. All right. So I want to, um, first of all, just uh, say uh, thank you to Green Step Cities and uh, Cities Charging the Head in helping us move forward. Uh, Diana, Caitlin, uh, Joe, and others have been super helpful for us as we look at our initial steps to uh, electrify our fleet. Also, as a member of the CCA, our Southeast Minnesota cohort has been extremely helpful to us. I mean, very, very good. So um, I really appreciate all of that help. I also want to recognize Excel Energy. They funded our fleet karma study. We participate in Partners in Energy. They've been super helpful, and again, they funded the entire Fleet Karma study that we did, and then Fleet Karma did our study for us, and um, they've been super helpful to work with um, throughout this process. So just want to thank all of you for your help with this. Oops, I'm going to get this figured out one of these times. Okay, so our objective in doing this, we really had a several reasons for doing this. One is to balance the upfront cost with um, electric vehicles with the total cost of ownership savings. As you know, if you go out and buy an electric vehicle, depending on what it is, you might be spending 35000 or so on that. And then you have to compare that with a vehicle that you might be getting for 22000 or something along that line and being able to justify that. So in doing this study, we're able to look at the total cost savings of ownership over you know, uh, owning that vehicle. How much do we save in terms of fuel, maintenance costs, and Fleet Karma does a really good job at that. I also added some things that I think we can quantify. We actually did not quantify it, but we should be quantifying staff time and miles associated with fueling the vehicle, and I should also say maintaining the vehicle. Because in our city, I'm at City Hall downtown Faribault. If we need to uh, fuel that vehicle, we have to go into Public Works, which is down on the interstate highway, so it takes you know five, 10 minutes to get out there. You gotta fuel the vehicle and you gotta go back. So if you charge your time, if you're a consultant, you're used to doing that, you're figuring out how you get this thing done, you're gonna add up some costs, and that's not included in any, any of the study information that we did. Of course, we also are interested in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. You're really related to that are the health benefits, you know, with idling vehicles and so on. And then um, demonstrating leadership in helping the community transition to electric vehicles. So those are some of the things we wanted to accomplish with this study. By way of background, Faribault does not have a fleet manager. So every department is responsible for their vehicles. So every, we just decide, okay, it's time to replace this vehicle. We have a budget, you know, we, we go out with our capital improvements for that. Um, and we replace these vehicles, but we don't have any one person looking at how we can do this efficiently. Um, when we did this study uh, with Fleet Karma, we got 20 telematic devices, and we'll talk a little bit about that. We just talked a little bit about that. We um, 
spread those 20 telematic devices over five um, departments, and we monitor our vehicles from June 2018 to June 2019. We're currently not doing that, but the telematic devices are still sitting in all the vehicles, and if we want to pay to start that up again, we can do that and see how we've changed that. Uh-oh. I'm not sure what's happening there either. I don't know where we're going to go to get back to this thing. Good. So it seems as though the remote is touchy. Screen. Any questions for Dave? <laughs> yeah. So while that's coming up, I'll tell you a little about uh, telematics. So telematics are these devices, and we'll show you that in just a second. Perhaps you can go back one slide when you get a chance. Um, and, but the telematic devices all plug into the onboard diagnostic port, which every vehicle has. You plug in these little black boxes in there, and those telematics then tell you a lot of different things about the uh, vehicle, when it's um, on and being used, how it's being used, how many miles it's going. Um, and actually, you can just leave. Well, go back one more slide if you get a chance, just so people can see uh, one more back. Yes, there it is. So that's the little device that you plug in. It tells you uh, factual information regarding the actual use of your vehicle. As we just talked about, I think there's advantages to this, but I think there's also things that you have to realize aren't perfect about this and that you have to use some judgments in the, in the data that you get on this. But one thing that I think is really helpful is if I ask people, well, how often do you think you're idling your car? I'm going to get one answer, but the telematics are probably going to tell me something else. Or how often do you actually use your vehicle? I use it all the time. I can't be without it. Well, the telematics might tell me something different than that. So, for example, you can get all sorts of information. This is just showing a period of time out of the 20 vehicles that um, we monitor, how many miles the different vehicles went. And as you can imagine, police and fire, for example, were the most used vehicles in the, in the fleet um, that we tested. And then in my department, community and economic development were closer to the end, where we might have a vehicle that's not used for weeks on end. I mean, it's just sitting there, not getting used at all. Um, but there's so many things that you can look at related to this. Um, the miles of gallons that you're using, how often the, the vehicle is um, idling, um, how often people are hard accelerating or hard braking, all sorts of information in terms of eco driving and so on. And you can sort this information in a number of ways. So, for example, one thing that I found really interesting in our study is the idle percentage. We have an anti idling policy. But the reality is, out of these 20 vehicles that we've looked at, just so you know, this is 50% right here. So these vehicles all over here are above 50% of the time that they're running, they're idling. They're not traveling, they're idling. So we were using it quite a bit, and a lot of that is um, in the police department, and there's some reasons for that, but there are a lot of things that are happening with electric vehicles, and I'm sure we can talk about that with police vehicles and so on, to be able to handle some of the equipment in the, in the uh, vehicle so that they can still be able to operate. But we have a lot of uh, idling going on. And the telematics tell us something about that. Just because of time, I'm going to show you two examples of what uh, Fleet Karma recommended where we could save uh, money in our fleet um, by transitioning to electric vehicles. And then one thing I should say, what the algorithm that um, Fleet Karma uses is they take the data, they look over that year, and they see how that vehicle is being used, and then they try to find another vehicle, an electric vehicle, that would save you money based on the way that you're using it. I think there's a number of things that you have to look at and say, well, you can use it more efficiently than, than the way you're using it now, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But the first one that we could save a fair amount of money on is a school officer vehicle that basically goes from the police station to the high school, whenever school is in session. It's only about a mile, mile and a half to the high school. Uh, it goes there in the morning, it comes back. And this gives you an idea of when I looked at this, which was June to March, you know, it went about 1,800 miles. It idled about 64% of the time. Uh, used 172 gallons of gas, emitted uh, two pounds per mile of uh, CO2 and so on. So it gives you an idea of how that vehicle is being used. You can look on the telematic um, information with your program that you get with this. Just get on your computer and look. 
and what you see in green bars are when that uh, vehicle was running. So generally speaking, at the beginning of the school day, it was running and idling quite a bit while it was at school. Then a couple times during the day, it might have been used for something. And then again, at the end of the school day, it was getting used. And when you look at all the different things, and you, and you can do a trip log to see how that particular vehicle was used, it tells you the number of minutes that it rode or that it was on, how much fuel it consumed, it even tells you the ambient temperature at the time that that was taken. So if it was really cold, there might have been idling more and so on, as well as hard acceleration, hard braking, those kinds of things for eco driving. So with all of that in their algorithm and fleet karma, they look at that and they said, if you replace that 2013 Ford Taurus with a Nissan Leaf, and this is not the plus, this is just the standard uh, battery electric vehicle, um, you would save $11,519 over the cost of that vehicle that you have. So that was our number one vehicle that we could save some money on. And the police department has seen this and they are interested in uh, moving that direction. Um, the last one that I'll show you is um, just barely made the cut. And this is really interesting to me. This is actually a colleague of mine in um, the housing department that goes to public housing every day. And it's about a mile and a half from the city hall to public housing every day. She drove, in this case, it was the month of November, 95 miles, and that's generally the case. So she used seven gallons of gas during that month, got 13 miles to the gallon, um, and idled 24% of the time, which is not much. She just started up the car, you know, went to the, the place and, and uh, came back. And you might think intuitively, well, that would be a really good idea for an electric vehicle because gee, you're just going a short amount of time. You're going every day. Wouldn't that be a good idea? But the reality is, and, oh, and this shows you just how little she uses. She uses it every day, but just for these really tiny, short little trips. Um, but the reality, when Fleet Karma does their algorithm study of this thing, they find out that really it's only going to save about $623 um, to get that Nissan Leaf over time. And that's largely because it's not getting used very much. It's not going very many miles. So over the length of that car, you're not getting a, a big return on it. So that's one of the things I think is really important. Can we do some things to be able to change how we use these vehicles and make sure that that vehicle gets used much more than the other vehicles. So just in terms of summary, we looked at 20 vehicles and based on how we use it, Fleet Karma said that six of our vehicles could benefit by going to electric vehicles. Three would be Nissan Leafs and three would be Mitsubishi Outlanders, uh, the plug-in hybrid. And many of our vehicles did not make the cut based on this study right now. Um, but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be or won't be in the future. And what I am trying to do right now is to look at a variety of things where we get electric vehicles and hopefully we will be getting one, we're trying to get one this fall at least, but make sure that vehicle, and, and as, a, as opposed to being assigned to a person, it's a vehicle that is the first out every day. And, and when you go to a conference or you go to something, that vehicle is always the first one to be uh, used and we put a lot of miles on that. I think there's a number of things we can do. Our building department, for example, has pickups. Um, they're all wheel or four-wheel drive pickups. Not every one of them has to be a four-wheel drive pickup. Um, and we can say, you know, okay, you still keep one of them for those really special needs, but let's switch to electric vehicles in other cases and make sure. So really, and we just talked about that in the Green Step Cities, right-sizing the fleet, trying to get that amount. I think get that down to a reasonable number and really benefit by maximizing the use of electric vehicles. <clears throat> so that's a brief overview. I know you have some slides um, that you can look at later. So if you do have questions, um, just take a look at that and feel free to email or call me and I'll be available for questions later. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> Next up, we have um, the city of Woodbury, Jenna Goffman is gonna come up and talk about purchasing because they have done some purchasing of vehicles. All right, thanks. So, okay, just to make sure. Actually, the forward is okay. I don't press it hard. Okay. All right, well, okay, let's go. All right. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having me. Um, as Diana said, I'm Jen McLaughlin, the City Woodbrand Sustainability Specialist there. Um, participating in the, in the City's Charging Ahead initiative was um, a huge uh, asset for us. You know, it really helped get us a lot of this information on what cities were doing in front of us, and it helped me make the case for getting some. 
um, vehicles purchased there in Woodbury. Okay, we'll give those shots. All right. So um, before, so one of the things that happened to the cities charging ahead is I learned about like other cities that were having a white bear Mitsubishi come out and um, bring the vehicles out, and let people um, go ahead and drive them. And so. Uh, we spoke to them and they brought it out into our public safety department and they really loved it. Like they thought it would be um, a great opportunity to work it into their fleet. Um, unfortunately, you know, it's only for special uses because um, they can't get all their equipment that they're, that they're currently getting into the Ford Explorers and into the Mitsubishi Outlander. But um, they are using it as an unmarked uh, vehicle for undercover. Um, the expected efficiency is that's the information from um, like the Mitsubishi website, but um, we are actually finding that um, I, our fleet manager just sent me a message yesterday and said that we're getting about 39 miles per gallon. Um, I would assume that that is more um, that incorporates the electric time with like actually what we're spending on gas, but um, but so it's definitely better than what we had because it replaced an Explorer that was 12.4 um, miles per gallon. Wow. So we're getting a big difference there. Um, they say that, um, I talked to one of our police sergeants, he said the detectives are loving this. And one of the reasons is because they can have the AC running, you know, if they're doing some undercover work and that it doesn't draw any attention because it makes absolutely no noise. And, um, and he said the only thing is, you know, some of the people are hesitant to drive it just because they're worried with that range anxiety, but they're overcoming that with education. And so he said, overall, they would definitely be interested in incorporating more. They just need to make sure that they, um, <laughs> they need to make sure that their vehicles that blend in well so they can use some of these undercover uses. Down here. Um, And then our utilities department, we have, um, we incorporated another Mitsubishi Outlander, and not that that was necessarily the best um, use for an Outlander, because uh, we generally have the smaller vehicles for that, but we had a vehicle that we needed to replace, and so it was an opportunity to get another EV in the fleet, um, because it was up for replacement. So whether it'll stay in utilities um, long term or not, I'm not sure. But we do also have two Chevy Bolts, which we had purchased a few years back, and those vehicles, um, I'm not sure why I cut that off, or why that's not on there. So, oh, well, here I have the numbers, but um, they replaced Cobalt is what we've generally used in the past, and so I did get the information there from our um, from our fleet manager, and what well, the part that you can't see is that the um, Bolt are like if you do cost per mile, which of course that incorporates how much time is being used as electric too. Um, one of the bullets is like 2.6 cents per mile, the other one's 3.5 cents, whereas the cobalt was 13 cents. So they are seeing um, significant savings there. And the outlander that's being used in that department um, is getting 51, 51 miles per gallon. So much better than um, what the cobalt did in the um, Passed at 16.9. And then our parks maintenance, I mean, this was, you know, something that they've been doing over time, so maybe not as significant, but still, they have seven of these um, electric vehicles that they use for for parks maintenance, um, and so they they get a lot of use out of those. Or I had to try to find ones that weren't real beat up because they do get used so much. So we also participated in the Fleet Karma study. I didn't get into the um, details. Dave did a much better job on this. Um, we're about to kind of dig a little deeper into this the way that Parable has, but we haven't yet. But through the study, it did recommend that we switch out five of our vehicles. So um, as you can see, one of the Explorers to Mitsubishi Outlander. So we've done that. Um, the the other ones, it's going to be again one of those things where um, we probably need a little bit, be, a little bit bigger vehicle for some of these um, because they can't get all the equipment that they need for public safety into those Outlanders. Um, and then they recommended that we do the fusion, our, our hybrid over to a Nissan Leaf, and um, so you know we'll we'll continue to look at those too. 
So we have ordered the um, forward hybrid interceptor. Um, so as, depending on how this goes, we just ordered one to see how that works for our public safety department because this is pursuit rated. Um, then they are hoping that we will add one per year or as as um, as the technology changes. You know, maybe there will be a plug-in option uh, later on. But um, they're definitely open to getting our miles per gallon down and trying to uh, um, improve our fleet over time. And then some of the challenges that we've run into, um, and I'm so our when I spoke to our fleet manager yesterday. So the Mitsubishi Outlander. Um, some cities have purchased this through a leasing option because then you're able to take advantage of this tax rebate. And but that wasn't something that our finance department was willing to do at all. And so we really had to work with Mitsubishi to try and get the price of the Outlander down to something that we could justify. And so it's um, it's just making sure that these are on the state contract, that it makes sense for cities. Um, and then the other thing that's coming up is this uh, the charging infrastructure because our volts. And so public safety and our public works facility is indoors, and so they can be charged indoors just with the level one charger. But as we want to incorporate these things into our building inspections and engineering and the other departments, we don't have that covered parking facility. And so it's a matter of you know getting the charge, paying for the charging infrastructure also. And so that um, we're, we're trying to work through that because we're going to have to justify that and how we can actually get these chargers in place um, and still justify it. And then another thing with the vehicle size, and I think this is one of the reasons they were willing to try the Mitsubishi and um, utilities, is that some of our meter readers are fairly large men who are very tall and feel like they're like putting the volt on instead of getting into it. And it's, um, it's just it's like the ergonomics of the units is trying to get like some of these bigger vehicles on the right side. And and then, yeah, we need to get to the pursuit rated EVs, um, education of stakeholders with that range anxiety. And um, yeah, I think that that's it. So we're just trying to make sure that we can, you know, justify the cost over, because again, as someone mentioned, this is the taxpayer money and we have to make sure that we can um, get that all to equal out. But overall, I mean, all of the feedback has been great from the departments that are using the EVs, and I think that there's definitely interest in continuing to expand it. And so our next step then, again, is to try and, you know, dive into it a little bit deeper and try and justify it and um, make a bigger, a bigger case for it. That's it. Thank you. All right. Uh, so next, Stu uh, Bass. From Fernsville, also um, uh, a member. Uh, both Jen and Sue were members of the Metro cohort. Dave, of course, was part of the Southeast cohort for City Charging Ahead. We'll have um, Sue come and talk about they did a bunch of chargers, and um, uh, it's a fun story because I think halfway through the tra City Charging Ahead, you weren't sure if anybody was listening to you, and then all of a sudden things were happening, and so that was really exciting to hear that in our one of our meetings. After Sue's done, I'll have Dave and Jen come back up here so that we can have some question and answer with folks. And if folks don't have questions, think about them. I have a couple. So um, apparently this is really touchy. So just the arrows. It doesn't have an arrow, but that's how you advance. That's, okay. And this that is was, the that's laser. the laser. Yeah. All right. I'm going to stand over here because Nasia Bean has such good luck over here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'm Sue Bass with City of Burnsville. Uh, and Again, I want to say how much encouragement that uh, City's Charging Ahead uh, offered us with uh, both the uh, purchasing of electric vehicles and understanding the charging and um, regulations and all that just uh, was very helpful and made a lot of sense, so much appreciated. Um, we uh, put in uh, a number of charging stations and we developed it all around the uh, what's known in Burnsville is called the heart of the city. And in that area, it contains the Ames Performing Arts Center, restaurants, Nicollet Common Park, which has a water supply, restaurants, apartments, uh, wine bar, uh, coffee shops, all that kind of thing. Um, and so this is a map of it. And there are three different uh, charging stations. Um, 
This is the AIM Center, Nicollet Commons Park. Um, one charging station with, uh, well, there's two chargers, uh, is on the parking deck. This is the parking ramp. And across the street, uh, there's apartments, uh, coffee shops. This is a popular restaurant. There's restaurants um, and shopping in here and apartments. So uh, very center of the city, kind of busy area uh, in, the, in this uh, spot right here. And why did we decide to do that? Um, well, there, we wanted uh, to make another reason to come to the HOC for having the charging stations and it's a great place to spend time while uh, charging up your vehicle. Uh, makes sense. We received a deep grant for uh, EV charging stations and the whole grant process was interesting. Um, I did apply for um, a Tesla grant. We are on the 35W corridor and it made sense to me that that would be a great spot. And uh, I never heard of Tesla. Mm -hmm. Even when I contacted them again and said I applied, what's going on? Never a word. I still haven't ever received a word. But we did get a deed grant from the Department of Employment and Economic Development. Uh, for the charging stations. Uh, Orange Line is coming to that specific area, the map that I showed to you in the future. It's also, we adopted a sustainability plan in 2009 and we're updating it right now. And so it is one, it is a sustainable strategy for the city of Burkesville. Um, and park staff are in the area on a daily basis. So they can take a look and make sure that um, you know, there's no vandalism, no damage to the EV station. So um, those are some of the reasons why we put it uh, in that area, especially for our first one. So I just wanted to go through some of the decisions that we had to go, we had to make as we were moving forward. Um, there are different vendors. We decided to go with ChargePoint. It was recommended, well-known, large network, app-driven, um, we also had to decide where are we going to put those parking spots and of course that is, was driven by where is the power, how can we get um, inexpensively to, we, so we don't have to run power too far and um, medium desirability. We didn't want to put it right in front uh, because we were concerned about um, people using it that didn't need to uh, charge their vehicle. They just wanted to be close and would pull in. So it's um, sort of medium desirability. Um, pavement markings. There are no standard signage markings and we chose green striping, but uh, that was a surprise to me. I, you know, I mean, for handicapped, accessibility, all those different things are pretty standard signs and marking but for this you just kind of come up with it yourself. So the I know we talked about pricing. Brian talked about pricing. City of Burkeville decided to go to um, we are charging and there is an app notification when it's the it's done charging. They're given a grace period of an hour to unplug. Um, and, but if they don't do that, then it's $2 an hour. So we want them out of the parking lot or out of the parking area so someone else can use it. That's can I ask a question? Yes. So when their when their charge is done, so not a certain amount of hours, but if it's a, yes. a car with a lot of machine for six hours yes. and then after yes. that, okay. Yeah, it's all about when their charge is full. Right. Yeah. And then they have an hour of a good period to get to the car and unplug. I guess if they unplug and just stay there, that you know, that's one thing. But we really we want to be able to um, have other people use it too. Um, some lessons learned. Charge point is a popular vendor. You just, we, um, sometimes 
there was communication problems. I know we were waiting for it to go, you know, after everything was pretty much done and we wanted to know, we were waiting for it to go online, um, waiting for a communication to let us know that that was going to be happening. And one of the park staff said, gee, someone's using the electric charging station. I see someone plugging it in and that's how we found out that it worked. So, you know, there was, it was a little bit hard uh, um, some of the communication and installer key. I know that's another communication situation where we contracted with a installer, but um, he did not have a commercial charge point license. And so before uh, he could install it, we kind of found that out at the last minute that they, for the warranty, they need that license. And so at the last minute, the installer had to go get the license. And I'm not sure what that all was involved in, but that was, uh, so that delayed it a bit um, for the, to install it, things like that. So this process with the application, you know, first I did it, and then there's another application, and all of this, learning curve, it did take us two years <laughs> to get that those charging stations in. Um, the next one should be more like two months. So learning curve there. Um, there's a great dashboard that shows real-time data as well as cumulative and um, we'll look at that data and consider if there's more charging stations that we need to put in the area as more use starts, as more people start using it. And we're hoping in the future that there's a public-private partnership that we can do with some of the city, different kinds of uh, areas, and looking at the different areas and looking here and just trying to figure out how to move forward. Uh, and so we did get the Outlander Mitsubishi for our code enforcement, uh, we don't have to charge it at the part of the city. We do have a, a charger um, by the uh, well, city hall, but uh, there's our mayor and um, some staff. Great. Okay. Awesome. Why don't you stay up here? Characteristic, right? right. Um, whether it's just for you or if it's publicly available. So, um, a lot of different kind of aspects here: charging vehicles, fleets, etc. Questions? There was a lot of stuff about public safety, and uh, so you guys are in the right place. Yeah, Allie. I have a question regarding uh, additions to your fleet. Um, it sounds like all of you have purchased them. Yeah, we haven't purchased yet, but we're serious about getting yeah. something this year. Um, have you guys had any concerns with your um, assuming your in-house mechanics? Uh, did they have to go through any training? Uh, or is there anything that you had to think about prior to adding it to your fleet? Because obviously they're different types of vehicles. The Mitsubishi has a great warranty, and so I think that their plan is just to go through Mitsubishi for, I think it's like a 100,000 mile warranty. Um, the Wolf, I, it's a good question. I haven't heard any complaints or, I mean, it's what I've heard from them is that they haven't had to do anything. Okay. So. Same here with our Mitsubishi that uh, they uh, plan to go through. Uh, they're hoping that there's another, because they're just quite there. Yeah, that's And so um, we did ask about that. Um, and uh, they are thinking about Having another um, place in the southern part of the metro area, so um, that'd be nice. But um, yeah, so far it's great. Um, I can't say that there are any problems. I did talk to someone who maybe it was in Washington County, uh, 
sweet person, and he said he was going to give uh, his mechanics some uh, training on uh, high voltage kinds of safety things. Yeah, I wanted to ask, um, did any of the cities up here look into e-bikes? If their like school officer was only going, you know, a mile and a half, like would a e-bike have been an option? Well, I, I think it's a great idea. The city of Albert Lee has been looking yeah. at that. Oh, sorry. No, I was going to mention, yeah, in our Southeast Minnesota cohort, we talked about that. And I think it is a really good idea. In Fairville, we do have a number of our officers on bicycles. So I think um, it would be something that we should be talking about, but we haven't. So I'm glad you brought that up. And I want to make sure we get a chance for other questions on the webinar. Yes, I got a couple comments and a question. Um, so first comment is that for um, Tesla chargers, the quarter grant funding is administered through the PCA, um, and so perhaps that was a result of some confusion. Um, okay, so anyway, question. Does anyone know if the deed grants are still available? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think so. Okay. Um, when did you get that? Process started two years ago. Yeah, it was a while ago. It's been a while. Okay. Um, that is maybe, maybe you can help me with the PCA Volkswagen Tom. Does anything else come out of that? I so I so I'm not that involved in Volkswagen, um, but one the grants have been awarded. That's what they let everyone know, and I'm not. They may or may not have. I think they're working on some new funding options. Um, phase, cool. phase two is coming yeah. out. They've done some feedback and gathered information and feedback from folks. They're getting ready for phase two. There will very, very likely be some additional funds for EV charging because they can use 15% of that money, that Volkswagen money, up to 15% and the overwhelming consensus was yes, um, let's do that. So um, we're expecting that there will be more grants on the, um, from the VW um, funds for charging. And this is uh, Craig from the League of Cities for people who can't see. Oh. And uh, I've talked with a number of folks in the uh, Pollution Control Agency about the VW funding and the next phases of it. EV infrastructure is something they're very interested in getting cities to apply for, but it has to be pretty specifically scoped to fit within what would be approved as part of that grant program because they're trying to replace diesel. So. Yeah, and I know that there are a couple cities, not, neither one is here right now, that got some funds that GPI worked with. Um, uh, they were pairing, looking at kind of the opportunity for solar plus EVs, the city of Fridley and the city of Coon Rapids. And some of it, it, the reason they were chosen is likely because of where they're located and the air pollution and those kinds of things. So um, that, that's a factor. I have one more comment from Northfield. Um, Good idea. They partnered with their Rotary Club Climate Action Team, um, who paid for part of their charging station. So, um, you know, finding different partners in the community, not just businesses, but other uh, partners. Be creative. Think outside the box. Who would benefit from? Who wants to see that um, that kind of infrastructure in their community? Tur Office of Tourism, etc. Whoever it might be um, in your community. Uh, question? Yeah. More directed at Dave, what was uh, the response from the Public Safety Department for the telematics uh, squad cars? So they had four of them, and they mostly put they put one in detectives, one community service officer, uh, service officer, and one in the school resource officer, and it, it was quite positive. I would say one thing that's really important. I'll just put in a plug for the ride and drive. We did a ride and drive afterwards, and um, the police uh, were there, you know, officers and detectives and so on. They did drive a number of the Mitsubishi's in particular, Outlanders, and were quite impressed. So um, for those particular vehicles, uh, they thought it would work out great. So I think they are very serious about moving that way in their next vehicle. And we do have, uh, I'll, I'll talk about the Strive Electric Minnesota site, but there's a ride and drive toolkit on the um, site. And, and, and it's a lot easier to do it just for your city, for the city staff. Um, versus doing one more publicly, you know, that takes a little bit more um and effort. Um, but um, there's there's great tools on our, our website for ride and drive. And if I could say real quick, yep. um, 
communication is important when you put in these telematics devices because one of our detectives did take it out and bring it and thought that someone had put something in this vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love the you know, whole idea of the um, the detectives liking them as if it's like undercover, mm -hmm. like because it is quiet, you know. Uh, so that's really an interesting um, piece. Um, other questions? So in the Fleet Karma uh, study, the telematics. Is the total when the total cost of ownership is calculated? Does it look at differential and uh, maintenance cost of fuel? Yeah. Yep. So you plug in all that information and yeah. Okay. So maintenance is the. Yeah. But like I say there, I don't think every. I think you can go further than what um, Fleet Karma does. So I think you should, you know use it with some caution. The data, um, but you know, again, from my standpoint, like staff time and so on should be figured into it. But it isn't. So I have a question. If, if so, you guys are all participated for a year and a half in this project. A lot of time and effort. Thank you. Um, so if the city said, "Okay, I want to do this," what's the first thing I need to do? What would you say, like, I want to explore electric vehicles for my city. What would you say the first step, the first thing that a city should do? You go pop first. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I mean, I think I think what made the difference for us really was having um, that ride and drive event where they can, and it wasn't necessarily an event; it was a school vehicle that they brought out. But um, I think that there's a lot of anxiety about this, and like being able to get into it, and you know, really yeah. have the opportunity to sit. In the and I thought it was interesting that you said that there was a, there was there was range anxiety because you don't have any full electrics. Um, yeah. And and so I don't understand because I'm doing this for a while right. the range anxiety because they have a gas backup like you, you're not going to run out they, yeah, it's not exactly. going to happen yeah it's not a full battery so that was interesting to me it's like oh well do they get so like is there some basic education <laughs> you know um if it's not a full battery electric you're, you're not your car's not going to just stop exactly. um and, and you know so that's interesting uh, other thoughts about you know what would you say a city should do first well um we have a sustainability team and i invited uh, a person from Elk River because I had gone to the CDA and heard about it. And so he asked got his Tom Sticker. Yeah. Tom came down to our sustainability team meeting and I invited the fleet people there too. And so he talked about that study and uh, listened to a lot of things that you said about how uh, beneficials and um, uh, electric vehicles would be, and then we had a ride and drive, and so they got to look at it for a chance, so they understood the uh, positives, the financial positives, and then, yeah, they all loved that outlandish. Well, yeah, and I think, you know, I think a few of you know my favorite hashtag is bus and seats, because that's what we've learned is that the best way for people to really understand it and overcome some anxiety is to sit in it, ride in it, drive it, because um, it's fun to drive in addition to all the other benefits. Um, and we can, you know, we have some great facts and I'll share with you some of the information we have to help overcome some of the myths out there. Um, you know, there's lots of benefits. I think people get it's more environmental, um, but the barriers also can easily be overcome because there's a lot of cold snow, you know, all these, you know, raised anxiety and, um, you know, it takes a little planning, but it's not rocket surgery. So. Um, any other? I'll just briefly thoughts? say I think you know Burnsville and Woodbury are two really model cities on sustainability, and I think talking about how you might approach this in relationship to the vision that you have for your community, and that this all fits in that vision. So the awareness and understanding is really important. I would also say for my particular community that is important as well. But money is really important. So if you talk about the economic savings, that gets people's attention, especially the council's attention, pretty quickly. Uh, well, we're going to stop right now. Thank you, please, for the, the panel here. Um, so now it's me. And I probably have more slides than I uh, can get through. So um, y you all know me. Hi, I'm going to get in front of the camera again. I'll move the camera. Don't worry. Oh, uh, okay. That's good. Um, so I'm Diana, and I had the privilege of... Uh, being the person that um, led, quote unquote, and the rest of my team is here. I just want to do a shout out to Chris Acuna here and Caitlin Bachlin, um, who were um, my partners in crime, the people behind me. It looked like I was doing all the things, but I was not doing all the things. 
with City Charging Ahead, and um, I'm just super thrilled um, to be here to talk about the results. Oh my lord! So I got this um, as a some some people might know that I have this thing where I do the selfie, and um, uh, for the last at the last cohort meeting, um, it was my birthday, and my staff. Uh, got me the selfie stick because I do the selfie thing and they are always awkward because I can't get it high enough. But now I have the selfie stick. So smile your prettiest smile. There we go. There it is. Okay. Um, so I'm going to quickly run through a couple of things and share with you um, just a, a little bit of an overview of Cities Charging Ahead for those who don't um, weren't part of it or don't know about it. <laughs> what happens when 28 cities decide to learn and act together on electric vehicle readiness? Well, um, we um, at first just you know overall goals. We were really focused on three main aspects: looking at electric vehicles for purchasing, looking at charging, and looking at how to guide private development um, when it comes to EV standards in your community. So, oops, well, see now. There we go. Um, so 28 cities, um, it was led by CERTS, the Clean Energy Resource Team, and Great Plains Institute, and we based it on the Green Step Cities best practices um, that are on the website. Here are all the participants, a number of folks in the room and on the webinar. Um, Amanda from Elk River, you know, got a little shout out. They are the leading city. They've been on this tra trajectory for quite a long time, so big kudos to them. So here's the, the different cohorts in the greater Minnesota folks. Uh, a lot of cities. We um, had funding um, that we had to expand and look for more when more and more cities signed up. So um, thanks to our, um, our funders, um, including XL Energy, who really came in uh, at a key moment with some key funding. Um, so we had these outcomes. We really wanted to have a bunch of cities exploring, kind of you know, adding the electric vehicles, doing that analysis, um, and then looking at charging infrastructure. Um, this is super exciting to me. So here's the results, right? You know, a little snapshot. Because we're at a Green Step Cities best practice or um, Green Step Cities workshop, 51 best practice actions um, happened from the cohort, which just makes my heart sing. Um, because that's what we're trying to do, right? We have these best practices. Let's use them. And um, you know, a special honor to the City of Red Wing for the most best practices, um, and our really good friend Paul Drodos, who led that effort for Red Wing, who retired in May, um, uh, but actually after his retirement came to our last cohort meeting. Um, and um, some of the most popular ones, the 23.5 is about charging, 13.3 fleet, and 6.5 is about comp planning. Um, and so, you know, of the cities, this just named some of the cities that added electric vehicles into their, uh, their uh, purchasing plan, um, into their city fleets, and you know, some that leased them. There was kind of a combination of cities, the way that cities did it, either purchasing or leasing. Um, some interesting things around there. Charging stations, 27 charging stations were installed from these cities, um, and more. And I, I think I keep hearing, you know, that there maybe are some more that happened, but it just we didn't have that data when we were wrapping up in June. So we'll go back and make sure that we accommodate or include all the information. So just a, that was just a snapshot about cities charging ahead, um, an 18 month effort that was just a joy to work with these cities that were so committed to doing this work and spent a lot of time, a lot of time and effort. Um, so this is what's coming next week. Um, we decided, as you know, this was led by um, CERTS and Great Plains Institute and the city charging ahead effort is done. It's not gonna live on, um, well, it'll live on in our hearts. Um, but it will live on um, as an entity going forward. So we came up with all these resources. That was part of the deal. You know, we help you learn some things and provide technical assistance. You cities help us as we develop some guides and tools so that the next group of cities that comes along doesn't have to recreate the wheel. We have here's where you start, right? And um, so it made a lot of sense that the place that we would put all these resources would be the Drive Electric Minnesota site. That's where people think to go for electric vehicle resources. And that is coordinated by the Great Plains Institute. CERTS is a member. Um, and so we're adding right 
somewhere in here, there or there, <laughs> will be a tab that's called Communities. Um, we're launching it next Tuesday on September 10th, so this is a little sneak preview, so shh. Um, so it's going to be called Communities Charging Ahead, because what we realized quickly is that while these resources were developed by and put forward um, by cities, that townships, counties, schools, other entities could use a lot of these tools. You know, some would need a little tweaking, but not much. So we wanted to broaden that definition, um, not just to be cities, so it's called Communities Charging Ahead. So that's what it's going to look like. Um, and oh, are you going to prepare? Sure. I don't need it just yet, but it's, so I'll just point to I'll, you and you'll be ready. Right We're going to do live. We're going to do this live. So um, you know, our goal is to inform and equip cities to um, with the information to educate the community and their city staff or elected. Um, and we, as I said, we use the feedback from them. And these tools are, you know, guides. Uh, so the communities tab. Um, uh, you know, it's about becoming EV ready, cities charging ahead. These are the three drop down menus. So, the, a lot of the stuff that Brian talked about will be under that EV ready tab. Uh, cities charging ahead tab will have all the information about that effort. Um, and then uh, there will be a charging guidance as well. Um, you know, I think I'm going to have you, uh, let's, let's just go oh, pull up the website. Here we go. You ready? Ready to go for a test drive? <laughs> the puns just never end. Anybody got it? Any puns? Any, any car puns? Ta da! There it is. Okay, oh, so I'm going to have to have, okay, um, so just scroll down. Sure. Yeah. Try and get it to stop blinking all at the same time. Okay. Oh, it's pausing the screen share. Oh, why? Because it wants to. Oh, so it won't show that? Uh, it'll go back. Okay. Okay. No, that's not what Okay. Here we go. No, it's PowerPoint. Yeah, I click that button again to share button. Uh, it doesn't want to. <laughs> that button. On that one. Again, uh, now hover over the internet. Yeah. Now we tell it to share the correct screen. There it goes. There right. we go. How can you tell? Okay. <laughs> so, um, so then uh, we'll scroll down. Uh, so, getting started. So, we've got here are the three tabs. So let's go into becoming EV ready. Let's just click on that and kind of go in and just see what you know that, that looks like. So this look familiar? Don't tell Brian if it doesn't, because he just talked about it. So here's all the EV ready principles. Um, and scroll down a little bit. And then we've got some great, you know, here's the policy resources, some really specific, like here's Salem Park, um, the ordinances that he talked about, you know, here's uh, Golden Valley. Um, so there's some great, great, you know, some a permit process from New York. So we have just a ton of resources that we want folks to have. Um, the charging guidance, um, you know, there's just a whole bunch of different things. So um, yeah, leadership models available, EV models in the Midwest. That's you know Yuka Kukunen's piece. There's the Elk River Green City Fleet um, guide. So we'll go back up or go, I guess, go backwards. Um, and then for the city's charging ahead tab, let's just kind of click on that and see what that looks like. So it talks about what it was. Here's that effort. And then here is a map of the cities. Um, and if you scroll down a little bit. Oh, no. Scroll down the yeah. screen. So look at this. So like you can take this and you can touch this and move this over. And as you move that over for population, because it's a small city, it'll start like the cities will disappear. So depending on if you're looking for a city that's around the same population, um, we've got uh, household median and household income, per capita density, and um, and then we have a number of easy related best practices that they accomplish. And then you can click on it by, there's like the different cohorts. Um, so you can see the cities charging ahead and um, what they did, and we want to do a big shout out, highlight to them. So, yeah, so that's that. I don't think there's anything more below that, is there? Uh, goals, oh yeah, and here's the accomplishments that I had on my slides. Um, 
that they did, um, and then some testimonials. You can click through here. I think um, I don't think there's anybody in the room here, but Anne Wright. There's Paul Jordos from Red Wing, and just their testimonies about being part of the process. All right, um, and then we can go back and we can go to the EV charging guidance. I'll spend a little bit more time here. So this is. You know, really, we wanted to have something to help people choose a charger because that was a struggle. Um, you know, what do I decide? How do I choose? What are the, the pieces? So, why don't you go down here and then, um, yep, get on there and go down a little bit. And we're going to play around with this. So, you know, you're trying to select a charger and you're going to select answers and then it'll give you a little bit of information. So, let's say we want it to be public. Perfect. Right. Um, and then it gives you some information, you know. Uh, DC fast chargers are closest to a gas station. Level twos work best in locations where people spend a couple hours. Like it gives you some information as you think about that, and then then you can go, okay, well, based on that, I think I really want a level two. And then it tells you a little bit more about level two. And then there's like, even a donation model if you know if you can't afford it. So do you want to be able to require payment for use? Let's say yes. So then, you know, this also then talks about okay, it's a smart charger. You know, you can do it on a pedestal, install it on a pedestal or on a wall, and then you know, give the information and you have to decide. Let's go ahead and mount it on a wall, or not. No. Let's no. not. No. Craig doesn't want to. No, I don't want it on. <laughs> um, so then, um, you know, selecting a charging station, pedestal, smart charger. Do you want to service more than one parking spot? Sure. Let's do that. And then we press that. So based on the answers you selected, we recommend you purchase a level two networked pedestal dual charging station. That is the language that you literally need to cut and paste and put into a procurement site to get that charger. So it's pretty simplistic, but it's a really good start for finding the right charger for what you want to do, like asking the questions and getting through this. If you hit next, it'll give you some more information on what Caitlin said. And then here um, is I can start to think about purchasing. So you click here for PCA grant opportunities, uh, for cooperative purchasing, you know, the Department of Administration, where the state contract is, they have chargers and vehicles. Um, source well is another uh, procurement opportunity. Um, you'll want to start doing some research on charging station providers, ChargePoint, Siemens, Clipper Creek, Zest, E Motor Works. There are a number of different chargers out there. We've heard a lot about ChargePoint. They've probably been around the longest. Um, they are not the only charger out there. Um, there are a number of different chargers. Um, some are local. Um, and then um, we've got this um, Drive Electric Minnesota uh, blog. Um, if you want to, or if you're interested in, you know, uh, opportunities to pair that with solar, and then you can start over. So get on the outside of the box, and then I think if you scroll down, there we go. Uh oh, that doesn't yeah. look happy. How do you make that happy? Mm -hmm. It looks sad. Sometimes you just have to refresh the page to get it. Well, then we'll, we'll take a look at that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is our web lady right here for the. So again, you know, we're trial trial launch. The launch is next week. So this is um, a really cool Prezi presentation that you click on different icons and it will <laughs> and it will give you just some um, ideas about where do you want to put a charger in your community. Once you've selected that parking lot or parking ramp, where in the parking lot parking ramp do you want to put it? What are the considerations? You know, retractable cord and, you know, just all kinds of different things that you wouldn't even think to think of. So uh, a bunch of different resources about site selection and where you're going to put it. And then scroll down. In addition, we so have... I will just add one yeah. quick thing on the site selection. Yeah. You can also download the checklist if you want to be able to print it out. Right. For example, or if this widget is not working when you want it to. Right, so the, the selection checklist. Yes. Okay. And then, um, do you want to go ahead and click on it? Will it let's see if that works. Oh, it's a it downloaded it. Yeah, it's a, okay, so now yes. you have it. We now have it. Great. So if you need it, LMC has it. Um, so then we have this public charging um, list, and we've got a, you know, click here for a printable version, a PDF version of the public charging checklist. So contact an electrician, make sure permitting is in order, all, you know, all the signage, and we've got some 
um, uh, things on signage. And yeah, there is no set standard, but there are a number of cities and places in Minnesota that have used the same stencil. Um, it looks like a, a, you know, kind of a circle around a car. Um, you know, there's a couple different ones. There's ones with a battery and a plus and a minus. I think the circle around the car looks better, but it's not my choice. So another checklist here, um, also downloadable, and I think there's one more below. So on the same on fleet charging specifically. So there's like kind of the public charging and then fleet charging and uh, a checklist. And workplace charging as well. So again, communities. So, you know, depending on what you're looking for. All right. So, let's see. Go back. One more out. Oh no, we reloaded this several times. We got to go back a few times. We are in a black hole loop. Okay, <laughs> so then um, that was the EV charging guidance. So those are the three drop down um, pieces from the um, communities tab, and then scroll down, and then we've got this frequently asked questions. Again, download the list here. Here's you know frequently asked questions and answers that we have. Perfect. So that is just a little bit. There's some other things that are not on here yet. So if we can go back to my PowerPoint, I'm sorry. I'm just, I know. Wow, you're pretty high maintenance. I am. <laughs> Thankfully, I've known you for like 27 or years. Or more years. <laughs> All right. So, um, you know, that was the community tab. There's the site. We'll make sure to get information out to you. And for the cities charging ahead cities, we're going to ask you to really, like, um, sing this to the rooftops in your communities. You were part of this. Your pride about being part of this and sharing that out. Um, so um, that's the tab. I wasn't. I, I had some slides in here because I wasn't sure. You never know how it's going to be with a website. So can you? Oh, that's me. <laughs> I'm like telling you what to do. <laughs> You're used to that too. Um, so. Um, and so, you know, the thing that's not on the site is the resources, some of the other resources we have. So we have a category of the resources, um, educating, engaging, promotional tools, and taking action. So for educating your community, we have um, EEV top 10 facts. Um, it's a four-page document with some really important points about electric vehicles and um, some bullet points um, that support that and some links that support that, all really good information. It's not intended to hand somebody this four-page document. It's for you to use to answer questions, um, to um, use as you talk or write about electric vehicles, to have the right facts in your um, toolkit. Um, we have uh, an electric vehicle content sharing kit. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. And then a slide deck. I just I was at the state fair and um, we highlighted a bunch of clean energy communities and some cities did these cards and it was so heartwarming to me that um, the city of Egan said that they participated in cities charging ahead. They told the whole state fair that they were doing that. Um, and then of course electric um, uh, uh, Elsberg talked about electric vehicles as well. And Eden Prairie did as well. They just weren't a city charging ahead city, so I didn't highlight them. Sorry. I love I love Eden Prairie. Um, so. So here's the top 10 facts. It really, you know, addresses the kind of the myths. Um, it's digitally available. The content sh sharing kit for communities. It is templates that you can use and tweak to put information about electric vehicles on your website, in your newsletter. You can link it back to your website if you have information or you want to share something about what you're doing as a city to connect it to Drive Electric Minnesota so that your community members can learn more about electric vehicles if they have questions to businesses that are asking questions about charging, permitting, whatever that might be. Um, samples, you know, for newsletters, press releases, etc. So really great tool. And then you'll see that I um, I asked for some press releases, and here's the, the city of Burnsville press release when they did when they launched their chargers. They had a four-page document to show people that map she showed um, to educate their community about where they were. We also have a giant slide deck. Um, that is an education tool for you to use for presentations to your community, to your city staff, to your electeds. It's in a lot of different categories. Great slides, just some basic information um, about um, EVs and um, also about city charging ahead if you were part of that process. Um, engaging your audience. Um, uh, we have fast facts, quizzes, and then the Ride and Drive Toolkit. I can't have enough opportunities to have pictures of me with, this is the Northeast cohort. Um, up in, um, that was in, in Bondalac, I believe. 
So electric vehicles fast facts, I think we had some on the table over there. Half sheet, just the you know really top things you want to educate and communicate with somebody, that's what you hand to somebody at an event or an event. event. Um, uh, it covers the basics. Um, we have a little um, thing on the bottom that gives the website um, addresses more of the perceived barriers. Instead of the benefits, I really wanted to overcome those barriers. You can print it, and we made it so it didn't have a lot of graphics, so you could easily print it and hand it out at your event. Um, EV quizzes, EVIQ. What's your EVIQ? You can use this in a, in a fun way on your site, in a, at a, an event, whatever it might be. Um, it's really a fun twist. You can combine it with a giveaway at your Earth Fest or whatever that might be. We also have a social media guide for folks that want to do some social media. Make sure people know, you know, hey, do you know that we have an EV charger at City Hall that you can use and some more information about that and how that connects to your city goals. We have some stock photos if folks are interested in that, looking at those things. And then the last thing is to, as a city, like to take action if you want to take action. Um, and we have a whole set of um, the Green Step Cities um, best practices um, list that is going to be on the site as well. Um, and then just so many fun photos from the last year and a half. Um, all the we did a big event, we had awards, um, meetings, uh, lots of road trips. <laughs> I went all over the state. Um, uh, yeah, we just had um, a, a lot of fun. You know, Duluth. There's a metro. Um, you know, just all over the place. Alex from Egan. There's a south. You know, I think that's southeast right there. So. Um, it just was such a joy, and I'll stop right there. I do want to let folks know that one of the pieces on the site is a uh, EV registration by zip code, and actually we have, uh, we're just finishing up a map that has um, data as of the spring of 2019, um, so that you can look at the EVs. And does anybody know how many electric vehicles as of uh, April of 2019 are registered in Minnesota? EV quiz. Come on, Jen, I saw your hand half up. I know Woodbury, I don't know. Oh, no. oh. 10,000. Uh, at the same time last year was 6,000. Um, so next up, um, this we'll, we'll be shouting from the rooftops, uh, the Drive Electric Minnesota Communities tab next week, uh, launching on Tuesday. We are going to start working with some municipal utilities that want to go on a similar journey so we can help you know, educate their members, do some surveying, and provide some customized tools for them to use as a municipal utility. Um, we're beginning to work with um, six or seven cities that want to look at the uh, value proposition of solar plus EV charging. So we've got a meeting, I think, next week or the week after to start working together with a number of cities that want to do solar with their electric vehicles. And done. We have one minute. <laughs> Sorry, that was a lot. Hey, everyone, Questions? Quick question online yeah. from Kelly. Do you have any material that can be branded by the city or utility using it? Specifically, why should I buy an electric vehicle and I just bought an EV now what? I don't know if those exact questions are addressed, but one other resource, um, we have that EV fact sheet, but the search team, um, if anybody is familiar with our right light guide that the search team puts out, um, it's kind of helping people choose bulbs, and we have a, a version of it where um, a utility can put their logo on it and use it. It's a two-page thing. We are developing, we have uh, at least a first draft, and we're developing uh, something similar, um, customer-facing um, document about electric vehicles that utilities could use. Um, I'm probably a city could use it as well. It was kind of designed for utilities just because we work with utilities so much, and they're getting a lot of questions because they do that electric thing. So <laughs> people are like, oh, electric vehicle, maybe my utility. And always check with your utility to see what the rebates and um, programs and such are um, from the utility. Yeah, Dan. Look forward to diving into that tool kit. Yay. Do you have resources for um, like refreshing and updating it over time? Or is that a pitch that needs to be made to a funder? Yeah, go ahead and do that and let me know <laughs> when you've got bags and bundles of money. Um, you know, we're um, there will probably be some. Um, we're going to launch and kind of get that out there to start with, um, and we'll see. Um, you know, this 
we don't have you know real uh, lots of ongoing funding for that, uh, but we felt like it was really important to get that information and such out there. Hopefully, we will be able to. Um, and the other thing that was said, um, I think, with Mejabeen and others, you know, we are doing some tweaking of the Green Step City's best practices, um, and mostly in kind of the action language or the star level language and such. Um, we'll be doing over the next couple of months because when we launched this program almost 10 years ago. 2020 is 10 years for Green Step Cities, and look, you know, um, be, be in tune for um, celebratory opportunities and um, things that we'll be doing as uh, 10 years of Green Step Cities, but, um, so we'll be doing some tweaking there, so I'm not sure, I hope so, I hope so, um, yeah. And then also want to just remind folks that the workshop series will be the first Wednesday of every month, next month, October 2nd, the Waste Market the good, the bad, and the ugly. So um, if you work on waste and recycling, um, that would be good. Do I have a slide about it? When, when Chris is looking at me and saying, there it is. Other questions? Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. We're super duper excited. Um, it took a lot of work, and again, I can't say enough about Caitlin and Chris on our team um, that you know um, made this this work happen because it's a lot of work um, and we're excited to help you on your journey and uh, connect to each other. So um, thanks for being here. Boom. I'm sure I forgot something.